Today on the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast, we talk about the law of averages and how that principle means good news for the Florida Gators football program. Not in terms of anything that's happened, but in terms of what's bound to happen this season on the football field for Billy Napier's club. This is the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. And welcome back to the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast. I am your host, Neil Shulman. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at All Kinds Weather. Full list of social handles down below. Please go ahead if you haven't already done so. Like this video and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Give us a five-star rating and a nice review on Apple Podcasts if you're listening there. And normally this is the point in the season or the point in the offseason where we do the state of the program address with some other Gator content creators. And that show is coming soon. Currently working on the guest list. I don't think y'all will be disappointed. But today is the setup show for that, where I'm going to be talking about all the things that have gone wrong for the Florida Gators over the past two years and how they can get fixed in a pivotal third year for Billy Napier. And that is going to tie in <clears throat> to the theme of the law of averages. First, though, the In All Kinds of Weather Forecast is proudly sponsored by 401k Generation, the wealth management company that helps you invest today for your future tomorrow. Their team of advisors is committed to providing guidance and education for your 401k plan and its participants, and they also offer a range of enrollment solutions that are tailored to meet the unique needs of your company's 401k plan. Whether it's savings for your child's college, investment advice, or even your retirement, 401k Generation's team of advisors makes getting to know you their top priority. Their advisors <clears throat> will tailor a path to assist you in navigating life's financial milestones and reaching your financial goals. That is 401k Generation, building stronger futures one generation at a time. For more information, please contact them at 866-998-5879 or visit their website at 401kgeneration.com. And then all kinds of other forecast today is unofficially sponsored by Sprite because this show required quite the jolt of sugar to prep, to research, and now to deliver. So today, or I guess yesterday, when y'all hear this, we all got word that Montreal Johnson suffered a knee injury that is going to sideline him for some time. That means he is going to miss the Miami game on August 31st, and he is going to miss the Sanford game on September 7th at a minimum. He is listed as week to week. The hope is that he comes back for Texas A&M in the third game of the season. From what I hear, there does appear to be some legitimate reason to believe that he will. But again, currently listed as week to week. And when you read or you hear the news of that injury, the immediate natural reaction, at least in your head, is... Yeah, sure. That that I mean that that makes sense. Trevor Etienne just left us for our biggest rival because he was unhappy with his playing time behind Montreal Johnson. So yeah, sure. Of course, Johnson gets hurt right after he leaves. It makes perfect sense. And if you're thinking that, you're not wrong because that's all true. This particular sequence of events winds up a little too conveniently to think that it was all just a coincidence that it all works out that way in that order. Of course, you know. There's no divine inter intervention or there's no demonic intervention here. I'm not going to be the one promoting that kind of conspiracy theory. But this is the kind of thing that is just so – it's – I don't want to say frustrating because it's more than that. It, if you think about it in more detail with all these – all these events, the sequence of occurrences that lined themselves up and aligned themselves in this order, in this way, it does get to be a bit enraging. But this is actually part of a much larger issue, which is why we're not going to spend too much time talking about the Montreal Johnson injury today, because it is only the latest illustration of a common theme for the program under Billy Napier and more largely ever since the departure of Tim Tebow on New Year's Day of 2010. Things going wrong for the Florida Gator football program. So today, we'll get into exactly what has gone wrong with the program, what's been done to fix it, and how things will look in the will we actually fix it department moving forward. And before we get into it in more detail, very quick disclaimer. 
I know that negativity has been dominating conversations around Gator football in the Billy Napier era. I know that. My goal here is not to add to it. But what I will say is, Gator fans, listening, watching, I'm going to make you a promise right here. For those of you, especially to those of you who are fed up with all the negativity. This is my promise to Gator fans. This show is going to get ugly. This is going to open some Gator football related wounds right back up. And it's it's going to be painful at times. There's going to be some reminiscing of some bad times. There's going to be some finger pointing. There's just going to be some very unpleasant and downright nauseating memories that might be conjured back up in your brain. However, if you stay the course and you make it to the end of the show, my promise is that every single negative thing that I rehash in this show today is not only going to make sense and be put into a larger perspective, but I will speak about them all in a positive light. Imagine that, me going through and listing all the ugliness that has happened for this program will be put into a genuinely non-BS, authentically positive light. That is my promise. It is going to be a rough ride today on this show, but it will end with a positive outlook. So with that promise now done, let's get into it. As we all know, the Florida Gators had a historic run of success in the 1990s and in the 2000s, sandwiched around a very mediocre Ron Zook era, but okay, fine, whatever. Bad years have to happen eventually. That 20-year stretch from 1990 to 2009 was really one that only Alabama can claim to have matched recently, and I'm not going to accept FSU as a comparison because they didn't do it in the SEC under Bobby Bowden. I know they played some big-name opponents. Yes, Auburn, Florida, Miami, LSU, Nebraska, Notre Dame were good teams, and I do have respect for FSU. Seriously, no troll. I do have respect for you guys playing those games, but FSU still didn't have to go through an eight-game schedule in the SEC. So anyway, beside the point. Point here is that Florida had a nearly unmatchable run of dominance between the Spurrier and the Urban Meyer years over those 20 seasons. And you know, I'll, 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 I'll level with you guys. To be frank, I did have a lot of Gator relatives. UF is a family school. My grandfather was lifelong friends with Stephen O'Connell. But even despite that, I'll, I'll admit that the Gators' dominance during that time when I was a little kid did help make my decision as a little boy to be a Gator fan a little bit easier because we all love to win. We all would much rather enjoy the teams we claim as ours being successful than suffer through them, right? So. I will admit I'm guilty of that, as I think I'd wager to guess a lot of other Gator fans are too. But here is where the name in all kinds of weather comes into play. Because since that Urban Meyer era came crashing down, the weather for Gator football has been particularly dark and overcast in some of the better times post-Tebow. And then there featured some torrential downpours of hail and Pun not at all intended here with the Miami Hurricanes, but some outright hurricane force devastation. From 2010 to 2021, this program was just downright infuriating to watch at times. Honestly, it felt like the the football version, not, not to get you know into, into religion too much, but it is part of the Hebrew Bible where Job from the Old Testament is a is a truly good man, and God decides to mess with him just for no other reason other than to to mess with him, to test his faith, to test his faith. <clears throat> now, the show isn't about either one of those things, either the Old Testament or the 2010 to 2021 seasons, but just very quickly, let's set the stage for the main thesis of the show. The very first game post Tim Tebow, Mike Pouncey, who is an All-American offensive lineman, just could not, for the life of him, snap the football. And multiple bad snaps rolled over John Brantley's head to the side. He, had some, he gave him some infield practice with some ground balls. And as in part because of that, also because the offense that year just wasn't that great, but Florida could only muster an anemic 26 yards of total offense through three quarters of ball against Miami of Ohio. And that set the stage for the next dozen years, because then Urban Meyer stepped down a second time, this time for good, and a true decade of darkness began. Even in his one good season, Gator football was at times an abject mess under Will Muschamp in 2012. 
In the biggest game of the year, for example, Florida turned it over six times against the Georgia team that did everything it could possibly do to try to lose the game, including handing Florida three turnovers of their own. Also that year, Florida needed a block punt just to save themselves from Louisiana. They barely survived with their lives against a very, very mediocre Bowling Green team and needed quite a bit of luck to get away from Tallahassee with a win that year as well. But they did win those games. Oh, yeah, and the Sugar Bowl, of course. Um, but the, the ultimate low points of that era, of course, came when Florida lost to Georgia Southern and Vandy in 2013, both of which came in the swamp. But while those moments do stand alone as as bad as it gets, things have not gotten to be that bad since they are the low points. They do have a good bit of competition nipping at their heels. There was Tevin Westbrook dropping a game winning touchdown pass against LSU that could not possibly have been any easier of a catch than if an angel had descended down from heaven and just literally handed it to him. There was Florida putting on a clinic on how to self-destruct and do literally everything wrong that it possibly could in a 42 to 13 loss to Missouri at home. That wasn't nearly as close as that score sounds. There was a time that Florida couldn't score a single offensive point and lost 27 to two against FSU. There was a time where FSU very year before handed Florida the ball with four Jameis Winston interceptions. Florida could only turn those four picks into three field goals and Florida lost because in part, Tevin Westbrook dropped another ball that got taken back 95 yards for a pick six. And I don't even have time to go into the off field issues during those years uh, that rain down upon the program, which include multiple quarterbacks being accused of sexual assault. That's Jalen Jones and Trayon Harris. Will Greer testing positive for PEDs, a credit card fraud scandal that destroyed the 2017 season before it even began. And the MVP of the Birmingham bowl, just, just for a little bit of comedic relief, literally pooping his pants mid game. And then that very off season, dining and dashing from a bowling alley with one of his teammates. And that is all just a very basic tip of the tip of the iceberg rundown of what went wrong from 2010 to 2021. What makes the stretch particularly galling is what happened at QB because Florida, which has produced three Heisman Trophy winning QBs and has a much deeper lineage than just those three. I mean, you could argue that two more should have been Heisman winners in Kyle Trask and Rex Grossman. They underwent one of the worst decades of overall QB output in school history. That QB play has been the source of just so much mocking and derision. Like, for example, in 2010, when Florida had Trey Burton throw the famous Tim Tebow jump pass and it got intercepted in the end zone in a 31-6 beatdown on CBS's one night game of the year, big time stage, top 10 matchup, national audience, and the jump pass gets mocked in front of a whole country or maybe it was the next year when LSU made an even worse mockery of the jump pass by throwing it themselves to rub it in the game that was already clearly over and yet for all the mockery that's been made of Florida's QB play here's the most absolutely earth-shattering statistic of them all Florida has had its season starting game one quarterback make it through an entire season without having to resort to its backup in a non- garbage time slash mop up situation just once since 2008. I'll let you sit there and think about that. We can go through the years too. Tebow in 2009 concussed by Taylor Windham of Kentucky 2010. You have the, the quote unquote three bow situation with Jordan Reed, Trey Burton and John Brantley 2011 Brantley is hurt multiple times. 2012 Driscoll is hurt towards the end of the season and has to be replaced for a game by Jacoby Brissett 2013 first Jeff Driscoll and then his backup Tyler Murphy both get KO'd for the season, leaving Florida with a walk on in Skyler Mornenweg for the final few games of the season 2014 Jeff Driscoll is benched for Treon Harris hours after that game. Treon Harris is accused of sexual assault. 2015, by the way, Harris never got charged or anything in that case, but just, you know, we're starting to get into that theme of just things simply not going well for the Gator program, regardless of who you want to point the finger of blame at. But anyway, 2015, we all know what happened with Will Greer. 2016, Luke Del Rio is hurt multiple times. 2017, Felipe Franks is benched for Luke Del Rio, and then Del Rio gets hurt. 2018, Franks is benched for Kyle Trask. Seems like Trask is going to take over 
after that Missouri game. But no, Trask breaks his foot and he's out for the rest of the year. 2019, Franks, who was not the best quarterback on the team that year, but nonetheless, nobody watching wanted to see what happened. Franks getting hurt in a gruesome manner in 2019 against Kentucky. 2020 is the exception. Trask lasts the entire season, but not for a lack of trying because Missouri almost took him out at the end of the first half in that game in Gainesville. They didn't, but that was that was a little scary. That's but that's anyway, the one exception. 21, Emory Jones struggles and has to balance some playing time with Anthony Richardson. 2022 is kind of a cop out, but it, it did happen. Anthony Richardson did play the whole season for Florida, but he opted out of the bowl game. You can put an asterisk by that one. Bowl games clearly do not mean now what they meant 20 or even 10 years ago, but nonetheless, it still happens. So the statistic does hold there. And then 2023, Graham Mertz gets hurt against Missouri. But we're not going to focus on the entirety of that stretch from 2010 to that 2021, because while a lot of bad things did happen, yeah, there were some good times, so I'll point that out again. There were some good times, like 2012, some stray moments in 2015 and 16, and then the first like, the first, the first 2.75 years of Dan Mullen's tenure. But overall, those 12 years were marked by frustration and just not good events occurring for the Florida Gators. And so it would appear as though things were heading in the right direction, simply because they had to be with Mullen, and then they didn't. So then the thinking became, okay, well, the Gators have hit rock bottom. Because, and, and by the way, I do not mean in the embarrassment category, because Georgia Southern was clearly the worst loss in school history. Um, nothing will ever top that in terms of embarrassment that I can possibly foresee. And Florida has not gone 4-8 and eight under Billy Napier. You know, that's good. It's a low bar to clear, but the point is Muschamp brought us to lower lows than Billy Napier. So I'm not trying to say that Napier has reached rock bottom in terms of the simple lowest low. I mean that Florida has hit rock bottom in the sense that I truly do not know what else can possibly go wrong for this program. I truly think that I have seen it all. This program has to start heading the right way by default. And I will revisit that at the end of the show when I fulfill my promise of shining a positive light on all this. But right now, I have to say, the more I think about the last two years of Gator football, to a lesser extent, the last three years, um, but really the last two with Napier, the more convinced I am that Florida has to have paid its debt to the football gods for its success with Urban Meyer and Steve Spurrier. Because as we all know, if you take literally any object and throw it up into the air, what goes up must come down. If you make a deal with the devil, your enjoyment tends to be shorter lived than your misery. And if you spend a lot of time in some sort of science related field, you know, Newton's third law of motion, which is for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So think about all that went well for the Gators in 1990 over the next 20, starting from 1990, over the next 20 years. And I'll really back up even to 1984. From 1984 to 2009 was a solid quarter century of enjoyable times for the Florida Gator football program. And then think about everything that went wrong from 2010 to 2021. I think if we're being honest with ourselves, every single Gator fan would take that trade off. Oh yeah, you, you mean we win three natties in the span of... 20 years in exchange for really in, in 15 years, just for being terrible in, in half of the next 12 seasons and still being respectable or, or better than respectable in the other six. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll take that. We probably would not have said that in 2009, but if, if someone were to tell you that in 1980, like right after that 0 10 and one season of 1979, yeah. Gator fans probably 95% of them would have taken it. But apparently the football gods realized that we would be happy with this trade-off and went, nah, sorry, that's not good enough. You haven't suffered enough. You still came out on top of this deal. This is not an even transaction for us football gods. And, you know, we're gods, so whatever we say goes. So Gator fans, get ready for one of the most agonizing two-year stretches you have ever seen, and then we'll be even. And before we get into that, the record is bad. Billy Napier became the first coach 
since Raymond Wolf in 1947 and 1948 to suffer two straight losing seasons to begin his Florida tenure. Now, like I said before, Napier does not have four and eight on his resume like Will Muschamp. That's good. He does, though, have an 11-14 overall record, which is way worse than it ever was for Will Muschamp, who, by the way, schedule toughness people out there, Muschamp in Florida had to face both national finalists in his first season, the eventual national champion in his third year, and two of the national semifinalists in his fourth year. And oh, by the way, he still played other teams in a very good SEC week to week. Plus, that was the height of FSU under Jimbo Fisher. So I, I don't want to hear about how hard the schedule is for Napier because you know what? It's always hard, but all right. Anyway, this isn't even just all the losses piling up. That's made the last couple of years. So frustrating. It's so much more than that. It is how the Gators have lost those games. That makes me wonder, despite my loathing of conspiracy theories, that there just might be something outright satanic going on here. And let's start with the Arkansas game. The very bare, plain fact that Florida lost to Arkansas with a dead man walking head coach on the hog sidelines in the swamp with a 32-year-old receivers coach and Kenny Guyton calling the for, calling the plays for the first time in his life was a very, very bad loss. I mean, if Napier... Yeah, I think this is fair to say. If Napier gets fired either this year or next year, that Arkansas game is going to be earmarked as the beginning of the end for him. And that game is going to be remembered for its ending and regulation and overtime. But the entire game served as just a nice little middle finger up to the Florida fan base. Like, yeah, you, you guys think you suffered that last game against Georgia? Huh? Wait till you see what happens next. Let's go back to how that game starts. Arkansas goes flying right down the field for a touchdown. Again, with a 32-year-old wide receivers coach calling the plays for the first time in his life after they fired offensive coordinator Dan Anos, flying right down the field for a touchdown. And then on Florida's very first play from scrimmage, one of the hardest working, sure-handed, most blue-collar, fundamental guys Florida's had in a long time in Ricky Pearsall not only gets stripped, but it's then scooped and scored, and it's 14-0 Arkansas in the blink of an eye. Like, really? Are you, are you kidding me? Him? That that guy? Pearsall? He's the guy who makes that mistake? Again, the hardest working, most fundamentally sound athlete on this team. And like in that moment, watching that from the stands, I was going, all right, well, that's bad. We're down 14 nothing. Now we got to be careful not to get blown out. And that's, I mean, that's a disastrous mistake regardless of who makes it. But let's say... Damian George missed a block or Trevor Etienne didn't pick up a blitz because that's part of why he didn't get as many carries last year as he wanted. And Mertz got strip sacked as he was mid release and Arkansas takes that back for a touchdown. At least then in hindsight, you could say, all right. Yeah. Okay. That, that kind of makes sense. I, I wish it didn't happen, but I'm not really shocked because there are, is a precedent of that thing that just went wrong happening. And this particular instance just happened to be more devastating than the average instance of it. But okay, nothing new. We knew that was a possibility. And then the end of game scenario probably doesn't play out the same way that it did, if not for that. Because as infuriating as the end of game substitution issue was, that's just what our special teams unit did. They find ways to make things harder. That's also what our defense does. They wilt down the stretch. They did it in almost every single game last year. And at some point, you just are what you are. And if you see a certain player or unit repeatedly messing things up and never correcting it, as a fan, maybe stop trusting it. Maybe expect failure from it, label it as a weakness, and hope that your beloved Gators do other things that can make up for that weakness. Pearsall's fumble in that game was the fluke data point, not the special teams implosion, because we know that our special teams unit sucked last year. We saw it do things that made us scream in frustration over and over and over again. But Pearsall is the absolute last guy you would expect to be responsible for such a cataclysmic mistake. But it happened. You know, first guy in, last guy out of the facility every day. I, I love that dude. He is... 
and not just a first round talent, but he worked his way into the first round of the NFL draft. I hate that it was him. And in some ways I still can't believe that it was him, but it happened. And we lost in large part because of that. Now let's look at the LSU rivalry. And again, it's not even the losses because yes, I hate losing five straight to LSU, but a five game streak one way or another is not unusual for a rivalry. I mean, look at Florida and Tennessee. Look at the 1990s when Florida pounded on Georgia like a drum with frightening regularity. It's the details of the way that Florida lost to LSU. Because what's happened in the last five games, or really not, not the last five, the last four, LSU was the better team in 2019. Yeah, Florida had a lead in the second half, but Florida lost to a better team. What's happened in the last four games of this rivalry cannot be described without at least wondering for a second if there's been some sort of demonic intervention. First, you have 2020. Literally a third of the LSU active roster opts out of that game. And Florida treats it like it's a bye week despite needing to win it. And we lose to their scout team as a 24 point favorite. And I mean, every single player who had any meaningful experience did not play in that game. Eli Ricks does not count. He became a better player as more time went on. Cordell Flott does not count. He became better as time went on. They did not have any experience heading into that game, any real experience heading into that game. Among the opt-outs, just and this is just a very, very basic overview of them, but among them, consensus five-star athletes, Terrace Marshall, Derek Stingley, Jamar Chase, and Eric Gilbert, the first three of which had huge roles in the previous year's national championship team and all got selected in the first two rounds of their respective NFL drafts. Other guys who were expected to be back in 2020 but wound up opting out of the entire season, guys like Kerry Vincent, TK McClendon, Tyler Shelvin, and many, many more. And as the season went on and injuries piled up for the Tigers, LSU wound up with a ghost of a roster. And they still come into the swamp and beat us in Max Johnson's first ever start. And I'm not even going to talk about Marco Wilson being an idiot at this point because there's a, there's a special segment for that coming later. But point is, that game never should have been that close. It never should have come to that. And if you want to talk flukes, too, the fog and Cade York essentially hitting a it was a 57-yard field goal in a, in a nerve gas cloud. Okay. You know, he's not a bad kicker, but the fact that he hits it and McPherson misses from actually a few yards closer. Yeah, sure. That makes total sense. Anyway, Florida doesn't learn anything from that. And the next year, a similarly toothless Tiger team beats Florida again, only this time as just a 14 point favorite, but also in the climax phase. And I mean that, yeah, that, I mean that in two ways. The climax phase of the Ed Orgeron turmoil and right as LSU was getting ready to fire him. And along the way, their backup running back, not even their starter, their backup running back, Ty Davis Price, sets a school record with 287 yards, most of which came on a very similar counterplay. And Todd Grantham, the defensive coordinator for Florida, just never bothered to adjust. And just, just sit there and think about that. LSU is at the height of their turmoil. Two years in a row against Florida. And our defensive coordinator could not possibly have done any worse than if he randomly picked defensive play calls out of a hat as LSU's B team beats us again. And then, under Billy Napier, the next two years, we serve as volunteers on Jaden Daniels' NFL draft tape as our defense Watches our offense score 35 points each game, which should be enough to win. And yet Florida loses both times by double digits. And those losses are made all the more galling because of how LSU tried to lose each and every one of them. 2020, which we talked about, a third of their team literally doesn't even show up. It didn't matter. 2021, LSU's punt protect team takes a nap and lets Jordan Pouncey block a punt to start the game. And then at the end of the first half, they just stand around watching like little kids who can't believe they get to watch so close to the action as Justin Shorter catches a Hail Mary on air, basically. That didn't even have to jump. Catches it in the end zone. That didn't matter. Florida still lost. And then under Napier in each of the next two years, LSU fumbles a kick. Once it's a kickoff in 22 in the swamp, once it's a punt in Death Valley, gives Florida starting field position inside their red zone for a free touchdown. And you would think, that it, at least in one of those games, 
Florida would have made LSU pay for their various shortcomings. Three of those games in which Florida was favored by more than a touchdown, eight and a half points or more, didn't matter. Florida lost all of them. Then there is the penalty issue. We talked about the Arkansas loss. We talked about the LSU rivalry. There's the penalty issue. And I'm not talking about the quantity of them because every team gets penalized. And Florida really, going back to the Spurrier years, Florida has had a penalty issue. I'm talking about the quality of the penalties because some of the penalties that Florida has drawn in recent years for one reason or another has been the source of outright frustration and enragement because either there is a crazy amount of sheer stupidity involved or because of the devastation that it caused. And in some cases, both two guys wearing number three Jersey on the field at the same time. I mean, like that doesn't even happen in middle school ball. Happened against Utah in the first game of the year last year. Spitting at an opponent? I mean, I, I get rivalry games bringing out emotion. And players and shouting and cursing at each other and, and even pushing each other. But spitting at an opponent like Jamari Lyons did? Again, you don't even see that in middle school ball. Actually, that's the second time I saw Florida do that against FSU in a year ending in three. Florida did that. Also in 2013 against FSU in the game, they wound up losing 37 to seven. You don't see that in middle school ball. The aforementioned substitution infraction that wound up costing Florida the game against Arkansas. Like that, like that just can't happen. You've got to get it up. You've got to get it together. You've got to have someone on top of that on the sidelines, but nope, not with Florida. And then like after after you go through those three penalties alone, the rest of the penalties that Florida's been hit with recently seem ancillary and harmless, despite the great amounts of damage that they did, like being spooked out by stadiums in Kentucky and Utah that don't even hold two thirds of the capacity that the swamp holds and committing some pretty awful pre-snap penalties in those games. Uh, actually, speaking of Kentucky, there was Dijon Johnson's leaping penalty against Kentucky last season. Now, this one is not a case of stupidity. This is one where you can't really get too mad at him. He was a freshman who was trying his hardest to make a play. This, this is more of a hustle penalty than a brainless one. So, all right, Dijon, you know, you can't leap over the, over the shield. Don't do it again. But, okay, the kid made a mistake. He was trying his hardest to make something good happen and messed up. Be careful. Don't do it again. But I respect the effort. I do. But the damage that unfolded as a result of that was absolutely horrifying. We all know what happened on um, the very next play. Ray Davis, touchdown, length of the field. And by the way, same goes for Ventrell Miller, getting ejected for targeting against Vandy in 2022. Senior leader, one of the few guys on that defense who was actually helpful, gone for the rest of that game and half of the FSU game the very next week. Oh, and speaking of penalties, and FSU, how about how about the one horrendously missed face mask call that ended the game in 2022 in Tallahassee, where on a fourth and 12, FSU's Jamie Robinson was flailing his arms at a scrambling Richardson, didn't catch him, but did manage to grab his face mask and twist it so hard that Richardson's head spun around like a haunted Japanese Oki doll. Had the referees been paying attention and had any interest in doing the tremendous amount of work required to reach into their pocket, pull out the yellow hanky, and actually throw it, Florida would have had a first and 10 at the FSU 13 with 40 seconds left, down just seven. But no, too much physical labor. It was late at night. They wanted to get home to their family, so no. And that is just in the Napier era. Of course, we cannot talk about the astounding penalties that Florida has been flagged for without mentioning the gold standard for stupidity that Marco Wilson set by firing Cole Taylor's shoe down the field after making a tackle in the swamp in 2020. And since I'm including missed calls in this part of the show too, why not reminisce about the missed targeting call on John Mechie on Trey Dean in the SEC title game the very next week? Well, but missed calls are part of the game. Well, you know, if, if you're a Gator fan, of course they are. There's a missed targeting call against Ricky Pearsall by FSU in 22. 
There's a missed targeting call against Damian Pierce by Auburn in 2019. And why stop there? Let's go back further. There's a missed targeting call or a wrongly called targeting on Jordan Sherritt against Vanderbilt in 2015. There's another one by Jordan Cronkright against Georgia that same year. I've lost count of my fingers. I'm holding my Sprite in the other hand. There's another one on James Houston against Vanderbilt in 2018. There's Kyle Pitts being bird dogged by a South Carolina defender in 2019. No flag being thrown. There's Kyle Trask getting blasted late against Missouri in 2020 and no flag being thrown despite the referee staring right at it. There was the phantom punch by Brandon Powell against Tennessee in 2018. 2016. And of course, if we're going to talk missed calls, why limit it to just penalties? Like, why not, for example, why not bring back the memory of Lawrence Cager catching a pass from Jake Fromm using the ground as a third arm? Why not talk about Malik Davis clearly recovering a fumble against Miami and the refs giving the ball to the Canes anyway in 2019? Why not talk about Brian Cox doing the exact same thing against LSU in 2015? And, and there are so many... So many more examples that we just don't have time for. We'll be here all day. Uh, I mean, we could talk about the the horrendously missed spot by the officials against Georgia, granted in a game that was already clearly going Georgia's way. But nonetheless, in 2023, that cost Florida a free set of downs. The Evan McPherson missed field goal against Kentucky in 2018. And many, many more that we're just going to, you know, we, we've been through enough. But anyway, that's a tangent. Point here is every single team gets flagged for penalties. And Florida usually is one of the most penalized teams in the country. That in itself is nothing new. You can go back all the way to 1990 when Steve Spurrier first took over. Florida was among the more penalized teams in the country that year. But over the past few seasons, the penalties that have been called against the Florida Gators seem to have been particularly devastating, either in terms of scale or in scope. And in some cases, both. And in other cases, in terms of how badly the officials missed the play or the call. And last but not least here, the coaching malfunctions. I saved the most infuriating piece of this for last before we get to the positive outlook that I promised at the start of the show. Let's start with the one that we probably all remember the most. Napier's less than bright idea to deploy a, a play that never should have seen the light of day against FSU, which flipped momentum on its head and lost Florida the game. And just, just for the record, I was I am not anti-trick play in that situation. Florida had a 12-0 lead, and the ball was already across midfield. Florida going for the kill. I, I get that. I'm all for that. So the idea was right. It was the play design that was so infuriating because it moved the offensive line out of the tackle box to the left hash, or, or to the left sideline to become a, essentially a, a caravan of blockers for Eugene Wilson, but only after the ball went back to QB Max Brown with four FSU defenders sprinting towards him through the area that the entire offensive line had just vacated. So what do you think was going to happen? Was, was he going to just Tebow truck stick all four of them out of his way? Like, that's the kind of stuff you got to catch before you ever roll it out in a game. But anyway, there was that. And, and there were plenty of other just awful play calls that were just badly designed from the get-go and were destined for failure. The the delayed fourth and three shovel pass against Utah to Dante Andrews comes to mind. The, the fourth and one against Georgia, where you're snapping the ball seven yards behind the line of scrimmage, comes to mind. And you, and you only have one passing option, meaning if it's covered, you're screwed. That comes to mind. But perhaps even more frustrating than some of the individual play calls has been the general in-game blundering of situational football. The general lack of urgency that this team showed down multiple scores in the fourth quarter against Kentucky in 2023. Just casually chilling like yeah it's all good you know you're not about to get embarrassed by mark stoops again or anything like that nah take your time hustle hustle if, if you feel like it otherwise just you know jog back to the line of scrimmage um there is a huge risk that napier took against utah in his very first game by burning the clock all the way down which by itself i'm okay with but then burning a timeout which I'm not okay with. And that was one bad decision from Cam, or one bad throw really by Cam rising and six yards away from outright losing Florida that game. And had that happened, Florida would have been five and seven in each of Napier's first two years. So, you know, maybe there's one for the law of averages. We'll talk about that in a minute, but just something to note, 
wasn't no wasn't for a lack of trying that Florida um, did not lose that game. Then there was the bad decision to go for it on fourth down on his own side of the field in the fourth quarter, not once, but twice against Kentucky the very next week, the second of which directly lost Florida the game. There was the abandonment of an effective run game against FSU in 2022 to start the second half and have Anthony Richardson throw three straight passes on the first drive of the second half. And then even though he didn't complete a single one of them, about three more to start the second drive when Florida's wide receiver group, by the way, was down to Ricky Pearsall and a skeleton crew. No, never mind that. And oh, yeah, never mind that Florida had gashed them for over 200 yards on the ground in the first half. So, of course, both of those two, first two drives to start the third quarter resulted in a three and out in a game that Florida lost. And also in this category, the special teams issue. I don't want to give it its own its own subsection. We've already gone on enough about this. So we'll, we'll go quickly through this. But we already talked about the substitution issue against Arkansas and the double jersey issue against Utah. How about Jason Marshall first trying to field a punt in his own end zone, which is bad enough even if he catches it, and then fumbling it for a free Vandy touchdown? How about Adam Mahalik missing an extra point in that same game? Which, by the way, Florida lost that game by seven points. How about Florida lining up for only or with only eight men for a field goal attempt against Utah last year? How about the Gators' attempt to overcorrect on that issue and lining up with 13 against Kentucky? And then, by the way, doing that again on defense. It's contagious. <laughs> How about Jonel Aguero, by the way, a head-to-head -head recruiting loss to Georgia, blocking a punt for a safety. And this is all not even accounting for the South Carolina game in 2022, a game in which Florida gave up a fake punt for a touchdown, muffed another punt, had one kick blocked, couldn't even get the hole down for another, gave up a 40-yard punt return to Juice Wells, and of course that was capped off by a face mask penalty and another 15 yards. Not, I mean... That's the kind of thing, though, that I can't really complain about because Florida somehow still won that game 38-6. to And it is kind of hard to get too mad about stuff that went wrong in a 32-point win. But then again, the very next week, the special teams issue was not fixed. And the special teams issues that I mentioned a moment ago with Marshall fumbling the, the punt in his own end zone and then Mahalik missing the extra point did indeed cost Florida the game. And then there's all kinds of miscellaneous stuff that, that has gone wrong the past couple of years that we don't even have time to go into. Like on defense, for example, stuff like the Brock Bowers play in 2022, where Amari Bernie was trying to swat the ball down, but he failed. And instead, essentially just volleyball set it right to his opponent for a long touchdown. The, the fourth and 17 against Missouri. Pretty much every single defensive snap against LSU since 2019. Ray Davis running for enough yardage to form a new continent in 2023. Consistently seeing guys out of position. Missed tackles left and right. Missed time jump, uh, missed time jumps on jump balls. Getting pancaked on the line of scrimmage. Prince Liamon Mielin taking plays off. You name it, Florida did it. Or, or, or by the way, we also don't, don't have time for the litany of off-field disasters that have played this program the last couple of years, like for example, hiring a new strength coach who bolted for Boston College after being in Gainesville for barely a month, or losing our recruiting ace, Joe Hamilton, to Texas A&M, or losing our explosive running back to our biggest rival, Georgia, by the way, because he wasn't getting enough playing time, then watching the guy he wasn't getting enough playing time behind get hurt, also losing several other quality pieces to other teams on our schedule, which, by the way, includes five-star safety recruit Xavier Filsame. We don't have to give all those issues their own segments, but suffice to say, wrapping that all up, all the bad stuff I just went through, suffice to say, it has not been a fun period for Gator football. So I just spent all that time running off the list of wounds turned scabs now for Gator football as part of a much larger point. At the start of the show, I promised that I would take all these miserable moments I was about to go through and turn them into a positive. So, here we go. The point is, the point of all of this, is there has been a monsoon of ugliness that has rained down on the Florida football program. And it's come from all different sorts of directions. The players not executing, the coaching meltdowns, the penalties, which I guess could be either one or both of those, the bad officiating, and just the plain bad luck. All very different issues, 
all have worked together to wreak havoc on this program. And here is where I say, enough. It has to stop. And I don't even say this, by the way, I don't even say this from a, a woe is me complaining perspective. No, this isn't coming from a, why is everything bad always happen to me? Kind of spoiled 12 year old girl who doesn't get a new iPhone 15 for her half birthday standpoint. This is coming from, okay, let's look at this logically. We've seen it all. Eventually, if you play enough close games and you keep losing them all, you play a few more and, and at some point that has to shift standpoint. It's the law of averages. And for those of you who aren't very familiar with the principle, very basically, the law of averages essentially states that the relative frequency of an occurrence will be similar to its probability over a period of time moving forward. For example, if a kicker hits 99 out of 100 extra points, but then he misses his extra point attempt number 101, law of averages states he will make his next 99. And it's not an exact science, but the end result should be somewhere in that vicinity. So let's say in that example, the kicker doesn't make his next 99 extra points, but he makes 98 of his next 99. Okay, close enough. Law of averages. And that's a very basic explanation. There are other factors that play into this, like fixed variables versus independent variables that are all certain to make future situations somehow not identical to the preceding situations that got you the data that predicated your predicted application of the law of averages. But for our purposes today, that's good enough. That's the law of averages, and that is the ballpark it places it in. And here is where we bring back the history of Florida Gator football. To reiterate the point from the top of the show, Florida football has a history of excellence. And that history is not forever, because it hasn't been. Not since its inception, but certainly over the 25-year span of time from the mid-1980s to the end of the Tim Tebow years. That was the period of time that changed the trajectory of this program, that woke up what a voice no less than Bear Bryant of Alabama called a sleeping giant and permanently elevated the standard. And for a program like Florida, I mean, look, look at Florida. Look at its resources. Look at its recent success. The law of averages doesn't mean that the program can be expected to sink back to the irrelevance it sat mired in for the first several decades of existence. Although it does mean that a bad year or two is to be expected here or there, which is probably the best explanation you can give for Ron Zook. But it does mean that Florida cannot and will not be down forever. And that, by the way, is not specific to Florida. You can apply that to other programs. Look at FSU with Mike Norvell. Look at Tennessee with Josh Heupel. Look at Georgia with Kirby Smart. Look at Texas with Steve Sarkeesian. Look at LSU with pretty much every coach that it's ever had this century. And that's why I also believe that eventually programs like Auburn and USC will be back. Oh, all right, all right. I should probably clarify. Um, when I say USC, I mean the California one, not the Clemson reject one that despite all of his struggles, Billy Napier still just casually owned like a four acre ranch. They've never been relevant for any extended period of time and never will be. But anyway, I'm a big believer in the law of averages, not just in sports, but in life. But I also wouldn't be invoking it here if Florida had lost every game by an average of 30 points and got 60 pieced by Georgia, like our friends to the Northwest did back in the winter, Florida's in the games that they're losing for the most part in nine of the 14 losses suffered under Billy Napier at Florida. At some point in the fourth quarter, Florida was either winning or down by just a single possession. I'll say that again. At some point in the fourth quarter, of nine of the 14 losses that Florida has suffered under Billy Napier, Florida was either winning the game, tied, or down by just a single possession. And by the way, in one of the other five losses, Florida was down by just a single possession with three minutes to go in the third quarter against eventual national champion Georgia before Dejon Edwards scored with just 35 seconds to go in the third quarter to make it 35-20. So 
9 of 14 and 35 seconds away from 10 of 14. And I'm sure at this point, people are thinking, okay, you're going to talk about recruiting, Neil. Florida's got to recruit better. Florida's lacking in the recruiting department. To which I will say, that is true. I will not debate that point in part because you can always recruit better. Because if you don't have four years in a row of the number one overall recruiting class in every single recruiting ranking system, you could, by definition, do better. So Florida has not had the number one overall class in any of the last four years. And in fact, Florida had to struggle to save a top 10 class this past year and did not have a top 10 class in either of the previous several years. So Sure, Florida could definitely recruit better. I will also say that seven of those nine losses that I mentioned a moment ago, where Florida was either ahead, tied, or down by just one possession in the fourth quarter, seven of those nine came against teams that Florida was more talented than, according to the 247 Sports composite rankings. Exception was LSU twice. But again, bottom line is that nine of the 14 losses, and really for all intents and purposes and for the sake of fair, good faith, rational discourse, we can we can say 10. Florida was very much alive and well and right there in the game in the fourth quarter. Now, that is not to wave the moral victory flag because Florida, believe it or not, lost all those games. And I am the guy that says good teams find ways to win games and bad teams find ways to lose games. And I will stand by that take. But at the same time, I will simultaneously stand by the take that if you play enough games and you keep hanging around there until the fourth quarter, at some point, it does shift. You will win some of them. You have to. It's the basic law of averages. And really, Florida's already shown that a couple times, like against South Carolina last year in Utah in Billy Napier's first ever game. But we're going to have to see that play itself out more in the future. Now, there have been various reasons why Florida has wilted in the fourth quarter of all those losses, some of which are not in their control, some of which very much are. Some of the problems that have been in Florida's control have been addressed. The defensive issue, for example, was addressed with an entire new coaching staff other than coordinator Austin Armstrong and linebackers coach Mike Peterson. Into the fray comes Ron Roberts, who basically fathered that creeper defense brainchild that Austin Armstrong loves to deploy. That's a huge help. And by the way, side note, we talked about that creeper defense with Derek Wingo. To learn more about that, definitely recommend you go check out that show. But anyway, Derek Wingo... um, Part of that defense will be back this year. He, he loves Austin Armstrong. He loves Ron Roberts. He's very happy with that coaching change there. Gerald Chapman takes over the D-line. Will Harris comes and brings a new energy to the secondary. I will not go on to say that Billy Napier addressed his special teams issue. I mean, he did address it in a way. He didn't exactly replace Chris Couch the way I think a lot of fans realize probably should have been done, but to his credit, he did do something. He did hire a second special teams coach in Joe Houston. Not ideal, not what I would have liked, but okay, he did something. So I give him credit for that. And a new voice at the controls of the strength and conditioning program has already paid dividends for Florida. And that alone right there, if you do nothing else with the coaching staff, That alone can flip some of those results in which Florida either couldn't finish the job or completely melted in the fourth quarter. And Florida has upgraded its talent, both through the portal and the high school ranks. Florida got a tremendous running back in Jaden Baugh, who, you know, every class, there's there are a couple of guys who are ranked as like average four stars that are kind of lost in the mix with 20, 30, 40, 50 other guys, even who are rated similarly with similar number rankings by their name, but one or two of those jumps up and plays like a five-star. This is a good candidate. I'm not going to guarantee it, but this is as as likely and logical of a candidate to be that this year as any. So Jaden Baugh, huge help. That's going to lessen the blow of Montreal Johnson's injury. Guys like Jalen Kimber and Miguel Mitchell are gone. Um, You know, again, the mantra of the show is keep it respectful, but keep it real. Keeping it respectful means this is never personal. Those guys are good dudes. I've, I've met them both multiple times. They're good people. They just 
did not put good game tape out there. In fact, they were responsible for a lot of the bad tape last year that lost Florida these games in the fourth quarter. They're both gone. They're replaced by guys like Traquese Bridges and Asa Turner, who played in a lot of meaningful games for Oregon and Washington, respectively. The defensive line got a massive talent infusion in LJ McCray and a massive experience infusion with Joey Slackman. And while Ricky Pearsall just is not replaceable, like I said before, that guy is just second to none in terms of in terms of his work ethic and just fundamentally sound and just overall impact on the Gators. Florida did reunite Graham Mertz with one of his old Wisconsin targets in Chimere DK, also brought in a very dangerous weapon in Elijah Badger. And this show is already long enough. Like we'd, we'd be here for another hour if we were to talk about the impact of every single offseason addition. But just to name a few more guys like DeAndre Johnson, Jameer Grimsley, uh, Brandon Crenshaw Dixon, uh, freshman ranks like Miles Graham and Aaron Childs, not to mention getting Shamar James back after he missed the entire five game or the last four games of the season that Florida lost. That's all going to help the Florida Gators. And as for the rest of the stuff that I ran through, that's pretty much out of our control and that's out of Napier's control. Napier is going to have some input in the play calling, but you know, that's still his show. But you can't control the officiating. You can try to correct the lack of discipline that led to all those penalties, but I mean, you just can't control the physics that leads to a targeting call with two 18 to 20, 22 year old males barreling full speed at each other across the field. You just can't simulate the pressure situation of a freshman like Dijon Johnson against Kentucky in what's probably the most exciting moment of his life not let alone his football career, to that point where he thinks he's about to make a huge play. He tries too hard, gets too excited, and makes a big mistake. You just can't control everything. And even more generally, even with the things that you can control, perfection is not attainable. It's not possible. In fact, as Vince Lombardi himself once said, perfection is not attainable. But if you chase perfection, if your goal is to be perfect, you still won't catch it. But you might just catch excellence. And here is where the law of averages really sets to kick in. Because no, Florida will never be able to avoid bad things happening, be it things in their control, like players not executing or bad coaching, or things that are out of their control. Just can't. It just, it just won't happen. You can't have everything go perfectly for Florida. But guess what? I do believe that Florida has taken some steps to address at least some of the things that are in their control or that have gone badly or that have gone badly the past few seasons. And as for the things you cannot control, like the anomalous plays, like Pearsall getting stripped or the officiating, or even just the scale and the scope of the penalties that just happen to be monumental in terms of their impact, law of averages. The amount of elements that have combined to go against the Florida Gators has been so literally unbelievable that I just cannot logically believe that that pattern will continue. The pattern of fantastically astounding turns of events that's worked against the Gator football program recently has just been so absolutely mind-blowing that I honestly think that the football gods have kind of run out of things to punish us with. Or if you want to you know, stay grounded to reality, the law of averages has to start working in our favor. And again, I don't say that from a bitching standpoint. I say that from a realistic standpoint. What else can go wrong? We've seen it all. I never thought I would see two guys wearing the same jersey number literally handing an opposing team a touchdown. I've never seen that in my life. I I guess I have seen a guy spitting at his opponent on the Florida FSU game. I never thought I'd see that in my life again, and I did. I never thought I would see a guy hand his opponent a win and destroy his team's national championship hopes by throwing an opponent's shoe down the field. I never thought I would see Florida give up 700 yards in a single game to LSU. I never thought I would see our best and Really, our, our biggest effort guy, the most blue-collar, fundamentally strong guy in Ricky Pearsall, first-round draft pick, not because of his talent, but because of his hard work. I never thought I would see him, I hate to say this, but 
be responsible for a Florida loss like that. I never thought I would see Florida or any team fail to count to 11 in terms of the number of players that ran out onto the field. And yet we have seen each and every one of those things play out. The last thing I'll say is I'm by no means predicting a national championship for Florida or even a CFP appearance. I'm talking about in terms of sheer frustration here, and I'm talking about everything, every last thing that has contributed to this fan base's frustration from the luck to the officiating, to the execution, to the off-field issues that have been cascading down on this program, to the anomalies that have worked against Florida, to every other thing that makes Florida Gator fans ever go I cannot believe that that just happened. The point of this entire show is I cannot rationally believe that that trend will continue. The results have to flip. The law of averages has to revert back to work in Florida's favor. It's a statistical guarantee that at some point in time, it will. And to be very clear, this is not sunshine pumping or blind hope. This is simple statistical probability, which is math, which does not have an agenda. And with the infusion of talent that Napier has brought in, plus the strength and conditioning upgrade that Tyler Miles seems to be, plus the new voices throughout the defensive coaching staff, all these things in the controllable categories that Billy Napier has done to address, it may as well happen this year. That is our show. If you liked it, please be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That's always very helpful. Be sure to tell your friends that this is the show that keeps it respectful, but keeps it real while ensuring that y'all stay up to date on everything Gators related. We do cover Gator football primarily, and we're right about ready to start talking football in, in more detail. Those, those shows are going to start coming out rapid fire, so be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Be sure... To tell your friends that we are the show that keeps it respectful, but keeps it real. Until next time, in all kinds of weather, we all stick together for F-L-O-R-I-D-A.